So my name is Daryl Zeldin. I'm the scientific director here, and I'm a physician. I'm a doctor, and I'm going to talk about the COVID uh, vaccine. So this is the this is the second session we're holding, and this is for uh, janitorial staff, utility plant staff, ground staff, security, and other other contractors. Um, so with me is Ms. Daniela Patino. She's going to, uh, as I talk in English, she's going to translate slide by slide into Spanish because I know that some of you prefer to hear the talk in Spanish. She'll also be helping with the question and answer session. Um, after we go through a presentation, which will be maybe 15 minutes, um, there'll be two microphones and we'll open it up for questions. And you can just come and you can ask the questions in English or Spanish. We'll translate it the other way and we'll do our best to answer questions until, until we're all done. Um, and hopefully we'll uh, be able to answer any questions that you have. So first, let me let me thank you all uh, for coming and for wearing masks and for distancing, uh, for being safe, and we do appreciate um, everything that uh, that you all do. Do you want to translate that? Sure. You have to talk into the, the mic. Yeah. Hello. Él dice que muchas gracias por you have to speak up and you have to put the microphone right to your face. Just take it off. Yeah. Él dice muchas gracias por venir y usar máscaras y que todos se sienten en una buena distancia de cada uno y que al final de la presentación, si tienen preguntas, van a haber dos micrófonos donde pueden venir a decir sus preguntas. Okay. I would speak up. Your, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is a picture here of the uh, of the virus, the coronavirus that uh, you've heard so much about, um, and it has a lot of parts to it. So the inside of the virus, which you can't see here, there is something called RNA, which is the message that the virus uses to uh, produce proteins that it needs in order to replicate itself. There are things called nucleoproteins, which again, you don't see in the picture because they're inside that little ball and they help the virus uh, replicate. There's the envelope of the virus. That's the gray area here. And so that's a, uh, it, it basically protects the inside of the virus and keeps the RNA and the nucleoproteins safe. And then there are envelope proteins, and you see some of them here in orange and in yellow and in gray. And they're proteins that are involved in helping the virus infect cells. And then there are these red things that kind of stick out from the virus. So these are the spike proteins, and these are the proteins that the virus uses to attach to cells in your nose and in your throat and in your lungs. Aquí estamos viendo una imagen de coronavirus. Tiene varias partes que le ayuda a sobrevivir en el ambiente y en nuestros cuerpos. Para esta presentación es importante saber dos términos. Primero, las partes rojas son las proteínas de las crestas, o también llamado la proteína spike, que ayudan que el virus se apegue a nuestras células. También es importante saber lo que es el ARN. El ARN es como las instrucciones para hacer proteínas en nuestros cuerpos. Okay. So the reason I'm showing you this is because I want to make the point that it's the spike proteins that are the target of the vaccine. And so the different vaccines that have been developed and that we're going to be giving here try to get your body to make antibodies to those spike proteins. And so, and they do it in a, in a number of different ways, but you're not, as part of the vaccine, getting any of the other components of the virus. And so there's no way for you to get infected with the virus by getting the vaccine. You're only getting one of many parts of the vaccine to try to stimulate your immune system to respond to the virus. Es importante entender que con la vacuna solo vamos a recibir los spike proteins. No estamos recibiendo el virus entero. So no nos puede infectar con um, el virus. All right. So to date, there have been six different companies that have work together to make different vaccines to coronavirus. Two of them you've heard about in the newspapers or on the news, Moderna, which was developed with NIH um, uh, investigators, and Pfizer, which, was, which worked with a company called BioNTech. These are the two that have been approved for use in the USA. 
So, estas son las compañías farmacéuticas que están um, desarrollando la vacuna. Y las dos de arriba, Moderna y Pfizer, son las dos que están aprobadas para el uso. Para... Okay. So, these viruses, the, the, these vaccines, use a technology called mRNA technology, and I'll show a slide later about what that is. And they've been studied extensively in clinical trials. And as I said, they've been approved by the Federal, by the Drug Administration, the FDA, for use in humans. So, estas dos vacunas usan tecnología de ARN, y vamos a explicar cómo funcionan en, en las próximas páginas. Y también um, the FDA ha aprobado que podemos usarlos en humanos y ha estado estudiando, ha estado estudiado desde el julio del 2020. So there have been other vaccines that are in development that haven't yet been approved by the FDA. We're not going to get those vaccines here. There's one that's made by AstraZeneca. There's one that's made by Johnson and Johnson. Um, they're currently in clinical trials. They're being studied now. And then there's vaccines from a company called Novavax and from GSK uh, and Sanofi. Uh, again, they are currently being studied in clinical trials. So these are not yet approved by the FDA, and so we're not going to, uh, re uh, we're not going to be giving those vaccines here at NIEHS. Las otras compañías como AstraZeneca, Johnson Johnson, Novavax y Sanofi todavía están en pruebas clínicas. Todavía no están aprobadas por el gobierno para uso. So solo vamos a estar implementando las vacunas de Moderna y Pfizer. So all the vaccines work in a little different way to try to stimulate the immune system to make antibodies to that spike protein. The Moderna and BioTech uh, Pfizer vaccine use this mRNA technology. AstraZeneca and J&J &J use something called adenovirus vector technology. And Novavax and, and, and Sanofi GFK, GSK uh, simply inject the protein uh, into your arm and you make antibodies directly to the protein. So Moderna and Pfizer usan tecnología de ARN para, uh, para crear los spike proteins. Las otras compañías usan tecnologías diferentes. All right, so how do the, vi how do the vaccines work? So, for both the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, um, they're basically, they have a, a sequence from the RNA from the virus, so one, one piece of the stuff that's inside the virus, and they wrap that in a, in, a, in a ball, basically, that has lipids in it, and then they give that as an injection into the arm, and what happens is that that lipid ball releases the RNA into the muscle cells. The muscle cells make proteins, the spike proteins from the mRNA, and then those spike proteins get released from the muscle cell and get recognized by the immune system cells that then make antibodies to the spike protein. So, aquí estamos viendo una vacuna de ARN. Y en esta vacuna lo que va a tener, va a tener las instrucciones para hacer proteínas spike. Eso cuando te inyectan, está en una bolita de grasa, entra la membrana y luego tu propia célula empieza a hacer las proteínas spike, salen de la membrana y luego tu sistema inmune las puede reconocer y aprender de ellas. O cuando uno está expuesto en el futuro a coronavirus, puede combatirlo. Ok, again, the point is that because they're only giving one part of the virus, there's no way to get the viral infection by getting by having the vaccine. Y es importante saber que con la vacuna solo está recibiendo el spike protein, no está recibiendo todo el virus entero, so es imposible que uno uh, tenga coronavirus de la vacuna. All right. So the Pfizer vaccine um, has been shown to be highly effective in preventing COVID. So it's been studied in tens of thousands of volunteers. And half of the people in the study got the vaccine, and the other half got salt water, so what we call placebo. And what the study found was that the vaccine was 95% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID disease compared to placebo. So for example, there were 10 severe cases in the study 
And almost all of those cases occurred in the group that got the salt water. Only one case occurred in the, in the, in the group that got the vaccine. And so because of this high efficacy, which is the highest efficacy that's ever been observed at any clinical trial of vaccines, um, an emergency youth authorization was issued on December 12th, and so the FDA said the vaccine is, is effective and it's safe enough to give to the American public. So, esto está describiendo los estudios clínicos de Pfizer, y en su estudio tuvieron 43,000 voluntarios. Mitad recibieron agua salina, o vamos a llamarlo el placebo, la otra mitad recibieron la vacuna. Y de esos 43,000, Solo 172 que recibieron el placebo empezaron a mostrar síntomas de COVID. Y solo 8 personas que recibieron la vacuna recibieron o tuvieron síntomas, demostrando que la eficaz de um, el Pfizer vaccine 95%. So, similarly, the Moderna vaccine, which is the one that was developed at NIH, um, was also studied in tens of thousands of people and found to be highly effective at preventing COVID disease. So in that study, they had 30 cases of COVID disease, and all of those cases occurred in the group that got the saltwater injection, the placebo. There were no severe cases in the group that got the vaccine, and it was very well tolerated with no safety concerns. And so again, the FDA approved the Moderna vaccine as being highly effective and safe. Y el estudio de Moderna fue similar, tuvieron 300 millones, mil personas en su estudio y solo 30 personas empezaron a mostrar síntomas severas de COVID, pero todos estaban en el grupo del placebo. Entonces, nadie que recibió la vacuna empezó a tener síntomas de COVID severas, demostrando que es um, saludable y no nos va a causar problemas. So, this is a graph that shows how effective the vaccine was. And so, the blue line. So this is the number of people who got, who got the COVID disease in the placebo group. This was the saltwater group. And the red line is the number of people who got the COVID disease in the vaccine group. And here on, on this, uh, the time is located here. And so this is the first dose. And then the second dose for the Pfizer vaccine is given three weeks later at day 21. And so you can see that after about 10 or 11 days after the first dose, nobody got the disease in the placebo group, but people continue to get the disease in the placebo group, right? So the, so the vaccine made a real big difference in terms of whether or not people got the disease. So, este gráfico está demostrando la eficaz de la vacuna. So, la línea azul está demostrando las personas que recibieron el placebo y cada círculo y cada cuadrito está demostrando una, un nuevo caso de COVID. Y luego la línea roja está demostrando las personas que recibieron la vacuna y como pueden ver, la gente que recibió el placebo están demostrando más casos de COVID, mientras los que recibieron la vacuna es más bajito. Importantly, the vaccine was effective in almost every group that was studied. So it was effective in young people and old people. It was effective in males and females. It was effective in different ethnic and racial groups. So in white people, black or African-American people, Hispanic, Latino people. And it was effective regardless of where you came from. So it, it was highly effective in everybody that it was tested in. So este gráfico está demostrando que el Pfizer vaccine fue eficaz en todos los diferentes grupos de edades, de diferente sexo, de diferente raza y país de origen. No discrimina entre cualquiera de esas cosas. And I also want to point out that the most effectiveness occurred in blacks and in people over 75 years of age. And those are the groups that are more likely to get COVID. And if they get COVID, they're also more likely to get really bad disease and die from their disease. Y también él quiere también empujar que la vacuna es muy eficiente con las personas mayores de 65 años y con la comunidad negra. This is the same data for Moderna for the other vaccine. And again, the top curve.
curve is the placebo curve, and the bottom curve is the vaccine curve. And again, after the first and second dose, the two curves separate, and you get a lot of cases in the placebo group, but no cases in the vaccine group. So again, highly effective. So la vacuna de Moderna también es super eficaz. Pueden ver las dos curvas. La curva gris está demostrando el placebo y la curva azul está demostrando la vacuna. Y los dos um, están mostrando los puntos negros, están mostrando las dos dosis. Y como pueden ver, después de la segunda dosis, la reducción con la gente que recibió la vacuna. And again, in the Moderna vaccine, it was effective, highly effective in all the different groups, young, old, males, females, um, whites, communities of color. It didn't make a difference. It was highly effective. And again, if you look at the communities of color, uh, almost 100% effective in that group. Y la eficaz de la vacuna de Moderna es independiente de edad, sexo, raza y... Yeah. So the bottom line is the vaccine is very effective at preventing COVID disease. So the FDA um, approved the vaccines. It approved the Pfizer vaccine on December 12th and the Moderna vaccine on December 18th. And then soon thereafter, the vaccine was shipped out from the federal government to the state to be delivered. So el FDA autorizó el uso de las vacunas de Pfizer y de Moderna para el uso um, en la comunidad, la de Pfizer para personas de la edad de 16 y mayores y la de Moderna de 18 y mayores. All right, so to compare the two vaccines, so Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, uh, they are very similar in terms of how they were made. Uh, they both focus on that spike protein. They both require two injections. They've both been studied in tens of thousands of people. Um, they both are given by an injection in the arm, and um, again, they're, they're both extremely effective. And so there really isn't a difference between the two vaccines. Um, we don't know whether we're going to be giving here the Pfizer or the Moderna. We will know soon, but it doesn't make a difference. They're both effective. I got the Pfizer vaccine, uh, my first dose, a week and a half ago. Um, but if they offered me the Moderna, I would take the Moderna too. It doesn't make a difference. So este gráfico está comparando la vacuna de Pfizer y la vacuna de Moderna. Las dos requieren dos inyecciones. Las dos han estado estudiando, estudiado con miles de personas. Um, so las dos son iguales. La, no, todavía no sabemos cuál tipo de vacuna vamos a recibir, si es el de Pfizer o Moderna, pero las dos son igualmente efectivas. Usan tecnología muy similar y han estado estudiando con miles de voluntarios. Okay. So there's been a lot of, uh, lot of stuff in the press about side effects from the vaccine. And I think that's probably the number one concern that people have in deciding whether or not they want to get the vaccine. So the most serious side effect is something called anaphylaxis, which is a severe allergic reaction. Uh, people get the vaccine and within 15 or 20 minutes, uh, they're, they, they have difficulty breathing, and they may break out in hives on their body, and um, it, it, can, it can be serious. But the important thing to remember is that it's a very, very, very rare occurrence. So it only occurs in about one in 100,000 people, so very rare. And if it does occur, it's very easy to treat. And um, with, a, with a single dose of epinephrine, which is something called an EpiPen, which you simply give as an injection, and it, it cures the anaphylaxis. So we are going to be careful when we give the vaccine here to observe people after they get the vaccine to be sure that they don't have an allergic reaction. And if they do, we're going to be set up here to take care of treating the allergic reaction. There are going to be doctors like me who are going to be watching uh, people for 15 to 30 minutes after they get the vaccine. And if anything should happen, then we'll take over and make sure that, that you get the appropriate medicines and that no, no, no bad things happen to you. Um, the other point to make is that, is that um, people are more likely to get the allergic reaction if they have a history of allergy 
to vaccines. And so if, if you have taken the flu vaccine before and you've had a, a, a very bad allergic reaction to the flu vaccine, then you should probably see your doctor before you take this vaccine. Um, but if you just have like seasonal allergies, hay fever, uh, runny nose, or allergic to foods or something, it's perfectly okay to take this vaccine. But again, we're going to be safe and make sure that we watch you afterwards to be sure that nothing bad happens to you. Muchas personas están preocupadas que con la vacuna a lo mejor le va a dar una reacción alérgica, pero él quiere empujar que eso es muy raro que eso pase. Una persona en cada 100,000 personas tienen una reacción severa alérgica y usualmente las personas que tienen una reacción así ya tienen un pasado donde son alérgicos a diferentes tipos de vacuna. Y también él también quiere decir que cuando ustedes reciban la vacuna aquí van a haber doctores, enfermeras, monetirando, asegurándose que todo el mundo está bien y si alguien tiene una reacción van a poder darles tratamiento. So the other side effects that can occur with the vaccine are, are mild. Um, so after the first dose, is two doses. After the first dose, it's very common to get some pain in your arm where they give you the shot. When I had the first shot uh, of the Pfizer vaccine a week and a half ago, my arm hurt about an hour afterwards until the next morning and then it stopped hurting. And in fact, the next morning I was able to work out, lift weights, do my normal. It was like I never had the vaccine, but for about 15, 16 hours, my arm hurt. Not bad enough for me to have to even take a Tylenol. So it was mild and it went away very quickly. So aquí está demostrando los efectos secundarios que pueden pasar después de recibir la vacuna. So la vacuna va en dos dosis, y usualmente después de la primera vacuna, los síntomas son muy leves, solo dolor en la área donde te inyectaron, pero después de unas pocas horas, 12 a 24 horas, se les va a quitar. Pueden tomar un Tylenol si gustan con el dolor. Okay. After the second dose, in addition to having a little pain in your arm, you may also get some minor side effects like fever, low-grade fever, fatigue, headache, chills. You may feel a little achy. Um, you may get diarrhea. Um, you may feel like you're coming down with the flu, but the symptoms are mild and they go away within 24 hours. Um, so they're not, they're not very severe and they quickly go away and then you're back to normal. I, I haven't gotten the second dose yet, but I'm expecting that, you know, within a day or so after my second dose, I'm going to have, I'm not going to feel so good, but the important thing to remember is I'd rather not feel so good for 24 hours than get COVID, which is much, much worse and may kill me. Y luego, después de la segunda dosis, las síntomas más comunes son que puedes sentir fiebre, fatiga, dolor, dolores de cabeza, escalofríos, dolores musculares, dolores de las articulaciones um, y a veces diarrea. Pero solamente son muy leves, leves y solo duran por como 24 horas. Okay. Um, the other point I want to make on this slide is that even people who got injection of salt water have pain in their arm and sometimes get fever and fatigue and headaches just because they're thinking that they're going to get sick from the shot, even though the shot didn't have the vaccine in it. And so there's something called a placebo effect, which means that just the idea that you're getting a shot in your arm may give you some of these symptoms. The, the symptoms are more common in the group that got the vaccine than that got the salt water, but not that much more common. El gráfico que está ahí está demostrando que hasta las personas que recibieron el placebo o el agua salina también están demostrando síntomas, solo demostrando que con la mente uno pensando voy a recibir una inyección, voy a tener un efecto, voy a sentirse mal. Okay. Um, so this is again the most commonly described reason why people don't want to get the vaccine. So let me see a show of hands. How many of you in the room have a friend or a family member that's had COVID? A lot of hands up. All right. Okay. How many of you in the room have had a friend and family member that has had COVID 
and they've had very, you know, they've had severe disease where they've had to either go to see their doctor or they've had to go into the hospital. Almost as many. That's not good. How many have known somebody, either a friend or family member, that's died of COVID? A lot of hands up. So again, you have to decide ultimately. Do you want a vaccine that will protect you from getting bad COVID, protect you from dying, protect your family from getting COVID, dying? You know, or do you want to have a few side effects that will last 24 hours and then go away? I chose to get the vaccine because I think it's the right thing to do. Plus, I want to be able to see my mom and my dad, and I don't want them to get sick from me if I have, if I have the disease. And so it's a decision that each of you are going to have to make. You know, we're not going to force you to get the vaccine, but I think that given um, how um, serious the illness is and how serious it can be, I think it's a, 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 a decision that, that probably most of you might want to consider seriously. Él preguntó que las personas levanten las manos si conocen a alguien que ha tenido COVID o si tiene familiares que han fallecido de COVID. So, lo que él está empujando es que, aunque sí, a lo mejor vas a tener un, un efecto secundario después de las dosis, es más importante uno protegerse a ustedes y a tus seres queridos, porque mucha gente ha muerto de esta enfermedad y así podemos protegernos. All right. So, um, we have on our website, and I, I don't know how many of you have access to our website or not, but there's a, a lot of details that are provided about how we're going to give the vaccine here. If you want to go to our website, you'll be able to, um, to, to, to read about that and learn about it. But basically, we're going to be giving the vaccine in this room. Okay? Um, it'll be very easy and simple. You'll go to one part of the room, and you'll sign in. You'll give your name. And then you'll go to another part of the room, and there'll be a doctor like me or a nurse that'll give you the shot in your arm. And then you'll go to a third part of the room where you'll be in a chair, and we'll watch you for up to 30 minutes to make sure that you're okay. And again, there'll be people here to handle any emergencies that will happen. Um, and then you're free to go. And then you're going to get a little bit of pain in your arm, and then and you may get some of the mild symptoms. And then if you get, and then you'll come back and do the same thing in three or four weeks for the second dose. So esta página de red está demostrando el plan de vacunación que tienen aquí at the NIH. Y él quiere decir que en este mismo cuarto donde vamos a estar administrando las vacunas, van a entrar, van a firmar sus nombres y luego van a dar la vacuna y luego lo van a poner al lado para monitorearse, para asegurarse que nadie tiene una reacción alérgica. Okay. Um, so we will, so how are we going to notify you? So we will go through your project officers, through your contract supervisors. We'll let them know that when we have the vaccines and you'll be able to sign up for an appointment because we don't want everybody to come at the same time. We want to spread out over several, uh, several days, really, maybe even a couple of weeks. And so you'll get an appointment and you just have to show up when it's your time to come and we'll communicate that um, through your supervisor and through the, through the, the core, the, the, the contract project officer. Cuando sea su turno para recibir la vacuna, van a informar a sus supervisores que les van a decir los diferentes días y tiempos que van a estar disponibles para recibir la vacuna. No van a querer muchas personas todo en un momento, se los van a repartir um, en unas semanas. All right, so you probably already know by reading the newspaper and seeing the news that the vaccine is being rolled out in phases. And so phase one are people like me who are doctors, nurses, Uh, who are taking care of patients who have COVID. We're at very high risk, and so we were the first ones to get vaccinated. That's why I got my vaccine, um, you know, a couple of a week and a half ago. Okay. Phase two are people who are called essential workers, and that means it's people that are whose job is so important that the organization can't function without that. And so that's where you all come in. And I have little red arrows here. So you all are group are group zero. You know, people who are ORF contractors, uh, janitorial staff, security guards, uh, people who make the building 
heating systems run, who make the electrical systems run, who take care of the water, making sure the water is on. All the people who are essential to making sure that if the building's not working right, we can't do our job. We can't be working on COVID research and finding cures and developing vaccines. And so we're all, we're putting you all at the front of the line and, you know, you'll be getting vaccinated before the scientists get vaccinated, before you know, the leaders get vaccinated. And the reason is because your job is so important and we want to make sure that you're safe, that you're healthy, and because you're at high risk, because you're throughout the building doing things that, uh, that put you at high risk for getting COVID. Hay diferentes fases en que van a repartir la vacuna. En fase 1 va a ser como doctores, enfermeras, personas que están trabajando con pacientes de COVID. Y en fase 2 son las personas que consideran los trabajadores esenciales. Y esos son todos ustedes en este cuarto. So, las marquitas rojas son demostrando a las personas en este cuarto que su trabajo es muy esencial y que queremos uh, vacunarlos a ustedes primero porque sin ustedes el instituto no funciona. All right. So that was all I had in my presentation. At, at this point, we'll go to questions. We have a couple of dozen people online, and I'm going to exit, and we'll go through. So if you're on, if you're online, um, then I'm going to have you uh, go to the chat function and enter your questions in the chat function. And if you're here in the room, uh, we'd like you to go to two microphones. There's a microphone here or a microphone here. And you can uh, ask questions and, again, ask English or Spanish um, or Portuguese. You speak Portuguese too, right? Oh, no. <laughs> um, and we'll do the best we can to answer. And, again, I'm, I'm here for as long as it takes until we get all the questions answered. And I know that there are lots of, lots of myths out there and lots of fake news and lots of conspiracy theories. Um, and I want to make sure I, I, I provide as much information as I can that's based on fact and that you can trust. And I want to make sure you feel comfortable if you're going to make the decision to get the vaccine, which we hope you do, making the decision, um, uh, you know, with information. Ahora estamos en el tiempo de preguntas. Hay dos micrófonos y ustedes pueden preguntar en español o en inglés, en como quieran. Y él quiere que ustedes pregunten cualquier cosa que han escuchado um, en, en artículos o en el en internet. Y si ustedes tienen dudas sobre la vacuna, por favor, suben y podemos um, responderse a sus preguntas. So, questions. So, just come up to the microphone. Don't be shy. Okay, so, let's go there first. Is the vaccine 100% guaranteed if you take it that you won't catch COVID? Uh, so, it, yes. So, why don't you repeat the question in Spanish? Él preguntó si la vacuna 100% garantiza que no vas a, con, vas a contactar COVID. It is impossible, impossible to catch COVID from the vaccine. Impossible. It will not happen. And the reason is because you're not getting an injection of a virus. You're getting an injection of one little part of that virus, that little red spiky protein that's going to give an immune reaction in your body against that one little part, but that one little part immune reaction will get rid of the virus. So there's no chance of you getting COVID whatsoever from the vaccine. Zero chance. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, uh, well, well, let's, let's, let's translate that. I'm sorry. So la respuesta fue que no hay ningún chance que de la vacuna uno puede contactar COVID porque como vimos es una parte muy chiquita del spike protein. No es el virus completo. So es imposible que te infecte con COVID la vacuna. Yes, um, while we working here, can our family members get it through here too? Can can our family members get the vaccine shot through us since we work here? Family members. La yeah. pregunta es si familiares pueden recibir um, la vacuna. Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, we can't vaccinate family members who work uh, unless they work here. If your family, if your spouse or or siblings work here, we can vaccinate them. We're not distinguishing between contractors or federal staff. You know, we're, we're anybody who's affiliated with the institute will be able to get vaccinated here. But unfortunately, we don't have, we won't be able to get enough vaccine to get family members vaccinated. However, um, when their turn comes in the phased in the queue, um, they will be able to get vaccines through public health clinics in Durham 
in Raleigh, in, 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 in Orange County. Uh, they'll be able to get the vaccines through their doctor's offices. They'll be able to get their vaccines through Walgreens and CVS. Um, it's going to be multiple sites to get vaccines for the for the general public. We're we're making it available here because we want to keep the workplace safe and prevent transmission in the workplace here, so that we can continue to do research to try to find cures for COVID. En este momento, la vacuna no va a ser disponible para familiares solo porque las cantidades son muy pocas. So en este momento, solo vamos a poder repartir vacunas a los empleados. If you had COVID previously, how long do you have to wait before you can get the vaccine? Si has tenido COVID, ¿cuánto tiempo tienes que esperar para recibir la vacuna? So, um, if you get COVID, your your body will will mount an immune response that will be relatively short lived. So it will only last a month to three months, not very long. But you don't have to wait that long to get the vaccine. You can get the vaccine right away. So if you had COVID two weeks ago and you're recovered, you're, you don't have any symptoms now, you're, you're, you're through with the illness, get the vaccine right away. There's no, there's no reason not to. If you want to wait a little bit, you can. But if you wait too long, you're going to risk not being protected from, from your natural immunity to the virus. So the immunity that you get to the vaccine is actually stronger with the information that we have on hand and the immunity that you would get to your to the natural virus and will probably end up lasting longer as well than the uh, immunity that you would get to the natural virus. Después de tener COVID, uno va a tener los anticuerpos y la inmunidad contra COVID por como dos a tres meses, pero uno no tiene que esperar uh, varios meses para recibir la vacuna. Solo cuando uno ya esté bien y ya no tenga síntomas, se puede um, vacunar. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So you're saying it's best to get tested first because if you're walking around and you may have, have it and don't have any symptoms. So should you get tested first before? Yeah. So you don't. So, so first of all, let, let me talk about testing uh, and then we'll, then we'll answer that. This, so the question was, should you get tested first before you get the vaccine? So the short answer is, you don't have to get tested first. You can just get the vaccine. If you've never been tested, it's fine. And if you happen to have COVID and you get the vaccine, it's fine. It's, it's gonna, your body will still be able to mount a, a, an immune reaction and you'll still get the protection, okay? So la pregunta fue, si uno tiene que hacerse el examen de COVID antes de recibir la vacuna. La respuesta es no, no tienes que esperar a hacerte el examen porque no va a tener un diferente efecto si uno recibe la vacuna y ya tiene COVID o si no lo tiene. All right, but let me talk about testing. So, how many of you have gotten tested in the car line? So, ¿Quiénes de ustedes se han hecho el examen so, de COVID? All the ones that, I've, that I've, I know and have seen around gleaning and gotten to get tested, yeah. Um, so, we really want you all to get tested every week. And the reason is because COVID is a strange disease in that not everybody who has the infection knows they have the infection. Some people have absolutely no symptoms whatsoever and have the infection and can spread it to other people called asymptomatic spread. Some people get the infection and get really bad symptoms and they're really sick. Sometimes they go to the hospital and sometimes they die. But a good por maybe 30% of the people who get the infection don't even know they have it, but they're spreading it to their friends, to their families, um, to their work, work colleagues. Dice, por favor, use sus recursos que tienen examinaciones gratis en el parqueadero, porque muchas personas que contagian COVID no tienen síntomas. Como 30% de las personas que tienen COVID no tienen síntomas, pero todavía lo pueden pasar a sus familiares, amistades, cualquier persona que están en contacto con. Yeah. So I get tested every week in the car line. It's easy. It's quick. It takes two minutes. doesn't hurt. You, you, you basically, they take a Q-tip, like you clean your ear and they put it in the front part of your nose. doesn't hurt. They put it in. They send it off to the clinical center in, in, in Maryland. And in two days, you get the results back. It's all done confidentially. And if you're positive, you'll be, you'll be, we'll reach out to you and say you're positive. We'll tell you to to stay at home and, and so you don't you don't infect anybody in the workplace. And my understanding is you can talk to your your supervisor and there are 
mechanisms for you to make sure that you don't lose pay for that period of time. Um, Uh, el examen es gratis, um, pueden hacerlo y pueden recibir los resultados en dos días. No va a afectar tu salario si um, sales positivo. So, por favor, usa el recurso. Okay. So, everyone, I would like everybody here to get tested at least once a week, if possible. After you get the vaccine, you still have to wear masks. Okay. You still have to wash your hands. You still have to say distance, right? And you should still get tested. And the reason for that is because the vaccine prevents you from getting sick from COVID. It doesn't prevent you from getting the virus. You can still get the virus. And before the vaccine and the antibodies get rid of the virus, you can still get it and transmit it to other people. And so until enough people in the population get the vaccine, and you get what we call herd immunity. Everybody's going to have to still wear masks and distance and take care of washing their hands. And so your behaviors aren't going to change. We're still going to require that everybody wear the mask. And I'm still going to walk around, and if I see you with the mask like this, I'm going to yell at you. Um, so we're still going to require masks. But And, and the reason is because the vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting the infection. It prevents you from getting sick from the infection, prevents you from dying from the infection, prevents you from having to go to the hospital. It prevents you from getting a bad disease. Se dijo que después de recibir la vacuna, por favor, hay que seguir haciendo unas examinaciones, hay que mantener usando máscaras, lavándonos las manos, manteniendo distancia, porque la vacuna lo que hace es previene que nosotros nos enfermemos muy seriamente y que terminemos en el hospital, pero todavía podemos agarrar COVID y um, pasarlo a otras personas. Y a lo mejor ellos no tienen la vacuna y se pueden enfermar muy seriamente. You just said something that um, I think bears repeating. You said something about pay, if they get tested and they have it. I think that may be an inhibitor as well. So would you repeat that? Yeah, so so I'm not a contract expert. Um, and you should get the information directly from your supervisor and from the, the project manager. But my understanding is that if you have COVID and you need to be quarantining at home, rather than coming into work, there are mechanisms in place to make sure that you don't get, uh, th that you can recover that pay. I don't know the details of that, but perhaps the super, is the supervisor here? Maybe the, would you like to address that directly? Maybe get, just come to the microphone. And I want to make sure that we get this in Spanish as well for the. Well, the company that we work for, HP Group, and the government has filed us to speak closer to the thing. The government had required us to pay everybody who stay out 14 days. They come into the office, they fill out a couple of papers out, we send it to the corporate, and they still get paid for the day they be out. Yeah. And we've been starting that since, since almost in March. So, so again, if you get COVID and you have to be at home for 14 days quarantining, or because you don't feel well with, when you get COVID, you're going to still get the the, 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 yeah, yeah. the company that's paying your, yeah, yeah. your salary is yeah. going to still pay you. Two things that you have to bring. They're going to have to bring the paper in and say they've been tested positive and bring the paper in and they've been tested negative. Right. And so, so. Very important. So, vamos a repetir lo que dije sobre el salario. Thank you. So, si usted se quiere hacer el examen, no deje que el miedo de que a lo mejor me van a pagar los días que no puedo venir, no deje que eso se pare de ir a examinarse. So, lo que estaban diciendo es que eso no va a afectar su salario, los 14 días que tienes que mantenerte en cuarentena, uh, tú ya vas a recibir tu pago, nada más tienes que demostrar el examen diciendo que eres positivo. Okay, very important. That's also a reason why you should get tested every week. So, if you get tested every week and you're found out to be asymptomatic positive and you're told to go home and quarantine, you don't have any symptoms, you're going to get paid for that too as long as you have proof of that test, that positive test. So that's something I would ask you and Don to follow up on, because I know that's an inhibitor for security force. Yes. Yeah, we've, we've, been, uh, we've been working with the security uh, uh, contractor as well on that. And we've had some that's been denied. So you need to make, make uh, the project manager aware of that. I just yeah. did. <laughs> okay. So we'll, we'll, we can take care of that 
centrally, I think. Um, yeah, that should not be a disincentive to, uh, it should not be a reason not to get not to get vaccinated for sure. Let me also say a couple of things. So when you get vaccinated, you're going to get a little card and it's going to have your name on it and it'll have first dose and they'll be tell you, it'll say whether you get the Moderna or the Pfizer and the date and the signature of the person who gave it to you, second, second dose, the Pfizer, the date, and then you'll keep that card. Okay. And you'll, I would take a picture of it with your phone and keep it in your phone because if anybody ever asks, have you been vaccinated? You know, you can say, yes, I've, I've been vaccinated. Here's my proof. Um, and that's going to be important because pretty soon, my guess is things are going to be limited to people who have the vaccine. So, for example, there's already talk now about, you know, the airlines not flying people unless they can show proof of vaccine. Now, of course, now it's not going to happen because we don't even have enough vaccine to give it to people that want it. But in a year from now, when we have a lot of vaccine and there are going to be people, and, and if COVID is still in the community, there may be places that you're not going to be allowed in unless you've been vaccinated. So keep that card with you. Keep it in a safe place because it's proof that you have vaccine. Cuando reciban la vacuna, van a recibir un papel y va a tener el tipo de vacuna que recibiste, si es Pfizer o Moderna, va a decir cuando recibiste tus dosis, la primera y la segunda, y va a estar firmado por ti y luego la enfermera o el doctor que te lo dio. Tienes que mantenerlo seguro porque en el futuro no se sabe si van a empezar a requerir, um, por ejemplo, aerolíneas, otras cosas que tienes que estar uh, vacunado para poder montar. Right. One more point to make. So, I know all of you are legal, but you may have family and friends who are not legal, undocumented immigrants. So when you go to get your vaccine, you don't have to provide any ID. They don't ask you anything other than your name and your address. There's no people from DIS there, so you're not going to be deported. And when you come back for your second dose, they don't have DIS security people getting ready to take you away and put you into a to a camp or something. It has nothing to do with it. It's perfectly safe. They don't, they don't ask for a driver's license. They don't ask for a picture ID. You give them your name. You sign, you sign, you sign, the, you sign up uh, and they give you an appointment card. You get your vaccine. Everything is done anonymously. Everything is done confidentially. No information is provided to anybody who you don't want to you, you show, here's my vaccine, vaccination. Él dice que esto no es pertinente a las personas aquí, pero a lo mejor tienen familiares o amistades que son indocumentados y todavía se pueden vacunar. No van a preguntar por ID, solo van a preguntar por nombre y firma. Y están haciendo esto porque quieren que toda la comunidad, todo el país, se um, tengan la vacuna. Yeah, I have many friends who are, who are Latino, who are not documented, as Daniela knows. Um, and they were very hesitant to get the vaccine because they were afraid that they were going to de be deported when they showed up for their second shot. It, it, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. Mucha gente teme que a lo mejor con hacerse la vacuna, inmigración se va a dar cuenta de su estatus, pero eso no es la situación. Él tiene amistades, yo tengo amistades que han recibido la vacuna y son indocumentados. So no es, una, no es un problema. Okay, I have a couple of questions online. Let me just answer, let me get through those and then I'll, I'll come back to you. So one question is, why do you lose your sense of smell when you get COVID? So one of the common symptoms that you get when you first get COVID is you lose the ability to smell. And because of that, you don't taste food. And that can sometimes last for weeks. Uh, in fact, there, there have been reports where it's lasted for months. And it's, it's oftentimes the most serious side effect because people can't smell things that might be dangerous to them, like smoke and so forth. And the reason is because the virus, and, the, and also the reason why we make you wear masks, is because the virus infects initially in the nose and in the back of the throat. And, and when it infects the cells in your nose and your throat, it affects their ability to sense smell. That's where your smell receptors are. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that, that's why it, it's a disease that starts in the upper airway and then it works its way into the lungs. So la pregunta fue, ¿por qué perdemos nuestro sentido de oler y saborear nuestras comidas cuando tenemos COVID? Y la respuesta es, es que las células en nuestras gargantas y en nuestras nariz son las primeras que se infectan y eso... Um, daña la habilidad de esas células para um, oler comidas y saborearlas. Okay, another question online. Uh, just confirming that if you get the vaccine, 
you can potentially still be infected with the virus. You just won't get COVID symptoms. You won't get the disease. Uh, but you still need to wear a mask. That's true. So how long does it take for the vaccine to take effect? So how long are you protected? So you get the first dose, and then three or four weeks later, depending on whether it's the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, you get the second dose. And 10 to 14 days after the second dose, you're home free. You're, you're protected. Um, you, you still have to wear a mask. But at that point, you can feel safe that if you 95% of the time or more, if you get COVID, you're not going to get serious COVID. You're not going to die of COVID. You're not going to be in the hospital. You'll get the worst that will happen is you'll get mild disease. You'll, you'll get no, no symptoms and you'll spread it to other people, which we don't want. So that's why we wear a mask. But you'll be protected 14, 10 to 14 days after the second dose. So, la pregunta fue, ¿cuánto tiempo dura para que la vacuna tome efecto? So, uno recibe la primera dosis y luego, dependiendo si es Pfizer o Moderna, tiene que esperar tres a cuatro semanas para recibir la segunda dosis. Y luego, después de la segunda dosis, tiene que pasar 10 a 14 días para que uno esté bien y protegido. Okay, we got four questions from Charletta. Um, I'll try to go through all of them. Says, so, do you have any knowledge of the vaccine causing rare cases of Bell's palsy? So I'm not aware of any cases of Bell's palsy due to the COVID vaccine. Uh, there have been cases of Bell's palsy due to other vaccines, um, but they they typically occur within two months or three months after the vaccine. And so we know because we followed tens of thousands of people on the clinical trials at least that long that if it does occur to the COVID vaccine, it's going to be extremely rare. And to my knowledge, there hasn't been a, a reported case of Bell's palsy. Um, same for a syndrome called Guillain-Barre, which is a neurologic syndrome that you'll sometimes read about, can sometimes occur after a vaccine. But again, it hasn't been reported, to my knowledge, with the COVID vaccine. Um, does the vaccine interfere or cause issues if a person has other existing viruses? Um, no, it, it has. It, it, it's a. It's a completely separate thing. It, so if you if you have herpes virus, if you have uh, you know, other types of viruses, a cold, then the the vaccine uh, won't make anything worse. Now, if you show up to the vaccine center and you have a fever, and you're having symptoms, they're probably going to send you home and say come back next week, because what they don't want to do is give you a vaccine when your body is already fighting another virus. And so they'll probably take your temperature and they'll ask you, have last, like they do at the gate, in the last 24 hours, have you had you know, symptoms? And as long as you answer no, then they'll give you the vaccine. So the question is, si una persona ya tiene otras, otros virus, si la vacuna va a interferir con, um, con eso y causar diferentes efectos. Y la respuesta es no, no va a causar cualquier otro efecto. Eso, por ejemplo, si no tiene gripe o tiene otra cosa, solo que no tenga fiebre, um, todavía puede recibir la vacuna y no va a tener, de, um, no va a tener mal efecto. Okay. Another question. How was the vaccine developed so quickly when the average length of time in the past has been five to ten years to develop the vaccine? So you heard Operation Warp Speed, right? Everybody's thinking they're Quick, quick ahead, they're cutting corners. That's not, the, that's not the case. And so the reason the vaccine was able to be made so quickly is because the NIH has been studying um, coronaviruses and trying to make vaccines for coronaviruses for more than 10 years. And there are other coronaviruses that have existed but just haven't been a pandemic where they've spread throughout the world. Uh, MERS was a Middle Eastern virus. SARS occurred in China. Uh, about 10 years ago. And when those diseases occurred, they were serious, but they were contained. And the NIH developed a program to try to develop vaccines to, to coronaviruses. And so as soon as we got the sequence to this virus, which occurred because of all the technologies developed at NIH on how to sequence viruses, they quickly made the vaccine and they quickly got it into the clinic where they could test it to see whether it was effective and safe. And so we cut off years at the beginning because of literally a decade or more of research at NIH over the, over, you know, over the last decade, you know, leading up to this. If this had happened 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we would not have had a vaccine this, this, like this. I mean, we, we would be having, it would be horrible because we'd be having millions of deaths and no, and no light at the end of the tunnel. So la pregunta fue, ¿cómo es que esta vacuna fue desarrollada tan rápido cuando usualmente se toma 5 a 10 años para desarrollar? 
Y la respuesta es que hay muchos coronavirus que han aparecido en, el mucho, en muchos años causando diferentes enfermedades como SARS y MERS. So, ya había muchos estudios en esas um, enfermedades y en esos virus y eso adelantó el proceso bastante. Si no fuera por eso, se demoraría como 5 a 10 años para desarrollar esta vacuna. So again, no shortcuts were taken in the clinical trials. The data were very clear. They were reviewed by a group of scientists who looked very carefully for, for bad reactions and, and, and it was deemed safe by a group of people, who, including Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins and the people who work at NIH who developed the vaccines. You know, it was, it, no corners were cut. Everything was done exactly the way it should be. Muchos doctores y muchos uh, researchers han visto esta, la data y la información y no han tomado ninguna, um, no han pasado ninguna procesos. Todo fue hecho al libro y muchos doctores, como dije, han visto la data. Okay, the other question online is, is there a breakdown of people who participated in the trials, the clinical trials? Uh, did some of them have diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease? And the answer is yes. So there were many, many people in the trials who, who had co, you know, so-called so comorbid conditions, so diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, kidney disease, um, you name it. It was, you know, again, tens of thousands of people from the general population, old, young. And, and again, the vaccine doesn't, doesn't work less effectively in people with existing conditions versus, versus not, and, it, and it's not less safe in people with these conditions versus not. So, la pregunta fue si en los estudios clínicos que hicieron Pfizer y Moderna, si habían personas que tenían diabetes o alta presión o enfermedades del corazón. Y la respuesta es sí. Uh, era una población de todas las personas de los Estados Unidos, muchas diferentes um, enfermedades y todo eso así. Y la vacuna no tiene ningún efecto en esas um, enfermedades. And then the last question I'm going to take online, then we'll go back to the questions in the room. It says, Why is the vaccine so effective, 95%, when previous vaccines, like the flu vaccine, are only 60% effective? And the reason of that, for that is because of the mRNA technology that I talked about. This, this technology is so good. It's never, it, it's never been um, as better as it is now. And in fact, I think going forward, the mRNA technology that been, was used for COVID is probably going to be used to make other vaccines for other diseases because it's so good. And again, we couldn't have predicted it was this good. The, the COVID vaccines are the first ones that were made with this mRNA technology, but clearly it's better than anything we've done before. And it, it, people like Dr. Fauci, who you know, have been doing this for, since I was a baby, um, you know, even he says he was surprised at how effective it was. La pregunta fue, ¿por qué es la vacuna de COVID 95% efectivo? comparado con el del flu, que es solamente 60% efectivo. Y la respuesta es la tecnología del ARN que demostramos en la presentación. Muchas vacunas que uno recibe para otras enfermedades no usan esa tecnología, es nueva, uh, funciona súper, um, es mucho, muy efectiva. Okay, let's go over here and then back here. ¿Cuánto tiempo va a durar el efecto de la vacuna para que lo proteja o volverse a vacunar? The question is, how long is the vaccine going to have an effect on the person? So, like, once it starts working. Um, yeah. So the, the short answer. So, so the short answer is, we don't know how long the vaccine will last. Um, as you know, with flu vaccine, every year you have to get a booster shot to get protected, right? I don't think it's going to be that like that. I think it's going to probably be longer, but I don't know for sure. And the reason is because we've only we've only known about this virus for a year. And best we can tell, at least for the people who got the vaccine in the, in the clinical trials early on, we followed them for anywhere from eight to 12 months now, and they still have good antibodies to the virus at least a year out. And so we hope that it will last for several years. Now, whether it lasts for a lifetime, we don't know. It may, it may not. There are certain vaccines that do last for a lifetime. For example, measles vaccine which now is required all kids have to get measles vaccine. You get one vaccine and you're protected from measles for the rest of your life. I don't know that this is going to be that good. It may, but we just don't know yet. So the worst thing is you may have to get another booster shot 
in two years or three years or five years or 10 years. Or, and we'll know more as we begin to follow people and follow their immune response and determine whether or not the immune response goes away. Todavía no sabemos, no tenemos suficiente data, pero a lo mejor en el futuro va a ser como cada dos años, cada cuatro años, cada diez. Todavía no sabemos, pero cuando salga más información nos van a dejar saber. Um, one of the things I would add to your presentation is the economic class, because as you list, a lot of us in this room will say, okay, who did they pick to be tested? So if you throw that in, that might help as well. But I think you sell yourself short because, and I hope you take this as a compliment, right now your reputation is the mass doctor. They probably turn into the COVID doctor after this. <laughs> for taking the time to do this presentation, so I just wanted you to hear that. But the issue for a lot of us in this room is trust with management. And you're part of that, and the people that are saying go get that shot is part of that. So one of the things that I think is true, and you can clarify for me, the doctor that worked down in Modena, is she an African-American woman? Yes. So even putting her face out here along with yours mm -hmm. and letting people know someone like us had something to do with this sure. will help build that trust. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, part of the reasons why we're, we're giving this in English and Spanish is because we understand that, that there are issues with certain populations and trusting the, the management and the medical, medical establishment in general, and, and rightfully so. Um, so we have, if, if, I guess most of you don't have access to, uh, to, to Zoom, but we gave, a, I gave a presentation similar to this to uh, the animal workers, uh, the folks who take care of the mice, who clean the cages and so forth about a week, a little over a week ago. And I gave it with uh, Dr. Jason Watts, who's an African-American physician who works here, who's a physician like me who had the vaccine. And you know, we, we, we talked together about, uh, and again, I, we, we, I absolutely appreciate that. I mean, it's, it's, it's important. And, I, and it's unfortunate that I'm, I'm thought of as the mask doctor. I mean, I, I go around and I tell everybody to put their mask up, but, Honestly, the reason I do that is because I want you all to be safe and I want you all to be protected and I want to make sure that, that you know, I'm responsible for everybody in this building, really. And we have, you know, a thousand people here a day and, that are coming on campus. And, I, you know, I, it's my responsibility to make sure that they don't get COVID. That's why I'm telling you all to get tests, because if one of you are, have the disease, have, have asymptomatic disease and you're spreading it around to my other people, you know, that's going to that's that's going to affect you know, the, the workplace. It's going to prevent us from doing the kinds of things that we need to do to try to find cures for, to try to develop vaccines for the next pandemic, to try to, you know, develop cures for, for the existing uh, coronavirus. So, so if I ask you to put your mask up, it's because I care and because I want you to be safe. And, um, and I absolutely get that there's a mistrust issue, but again, all, all we can do is, is, is answer questions and be honest and give you the facts. And it's up to you what, what you want to do, but I hope you make the decision to, to protect yourself and to protect your family. So el señor estaba comentando que él siente que a veces no hay confianza con los personas uh, superiores como los doctores o los jefes, personas así, y que él siente que él tendría más confianza si demuestran a doctores como personas de color que han um, hecho muchas cosas para esta vacuna y para esta enfermedad y que las personas sepan que esta vacuna no es obligatoria, es opcional, nada más queremos darle a ustedes toda la información que tenemos. Other questions. Some of the myths that you hear, so, so you can't get COVID from the vaccine, no, there are no barcodes that are inserted in the vaccine that are going to track you for the rest of your life. Um, no, the vaccine can't in, in, get, in, get into your DNA and change your DNA. That, that can't happen. It's impossible. Um, you know, there's lots of conspiracy theories you read about in the newspaper, you, you, you read about on social media, on Facebook, et cetera. You know, you should, you should rely on, on facts and, and reputable uh, sources of information like the CDC, um, like public health departments, like FDA, like the NIH. Hay mucha información negativa que está, o falsa, mejor dicho, que está en la red y que es importante buscar nuestra información de lugares seguros um, y muchas uh, mentiras que están en la red, como que la vacuna te puede dar COVID, eso es falso, cosas así, o que el gobierno te va a estar viendo después de que te dan la vacuna, todo eso es falso. 
I don't have a question, Dr. Zeller, but I just want to personally thank you for what you're doing to keep us safe. I just, that's all. You're, you're most welcome. Nothing would make me happier than you all get vaccinated. In fact, the whole population gets vaccinated, and in six months or nine months, we can go back to life life as we know it, you know, without masks and go to restaurants and, and not have to worry about our elderly relatives dying and not have to worry about our friends and family dying of COVID. I mean, nothing would make me happier. All right, I think unless there's other questions. So you know, you all know where I live. I live up on A2, the room with the candy. Um, feel free to stop by if, I mean, again, I'm, I'm here almost all days and I'm usually here into the evenings. If you have private questions or if you wanna, if you wanna ask me something, you know, again, I'm, I'm around, just, just knock on the door, make sure you wear a mask and, and I'm happy to answer for you. Also, I'll give you my email address and actually, Danny, maybe you can give your email address uh, as well, and you can ask questions by email or or or, or texting to us. And, and again, we'll we'll do our best to answer the questions if, you, if something comes up afterwards. So my e email address is zeldin at niehs.nih.gov. Why don't you? And then and then Danny's she'll she'll say hers in Spanish. Sure. So me me email address is daniela at nih.gov. Si quieren contactarme también después de la presentación, si quieren hablar conmigo, podemos platicar. Si tienen preguntas, también puedo pasar mi número si quieren textearme sobre cosas. El doctor Zeldin también puede pasar su email también y también su oficina queda en A200 si tienen preguntas que quieren preguntarle personalmente. Yeah, and if I don't know the answer, and I may not know the answer, if you ask me a difficult question, I'll find out and I'll or I'll tell you that we don't know yet. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, like Dr. Fauci, I'm gonna just be honest with you. And if we don't have the information yet, I'll, I'll tell you we don't know, so. Y si no sabemos la respuesta a una pregunta, vamos a ser honestos con ustedes y decir que todavía no tenemos suficiente data, pero en el futuro vamos a saber. The only question I do have, when you said a while ago that we would be contacted or we could go through the webpage, would it be uh, feasible for you to just let our project officer know when yeah. So I, I so the que the question was, how will we let you know when when the vaccine is ready to give? And yes, we will go through the project officer. We'll go through the project officer. We'll give you all the information that you need. We'll we'll show you how to how to sign up, when your appointment is. Yeah, we'll we'll take care of all of that. So all you'll you so you'll be contacted when it's time for you to. And, and for those of you who don't have email or don't have access to the to the NIH email system, we'll we'll find you and we'll make sure that you know when you're supposed to show up for the vaccine. You want to do that in Spanish? No. Yes, I understand. El preguntó cómo van a ser notificados de cuándo la vacuna está disponible y va a ser a través de su um, contracting officer que les va a decir cuándo pueden venir a vacunar. Okay. Other questions. No? Okay. So I got a question online. It says, in this morning's briefing, Dr. Walensky shared data closer to 2.5 million Moderna and 6 million Pfizer people had had anaphylaxis after the vaccine. Uh, this is in contrast to the 1,600 per million cases die, a very powerful comparison. I'm sorry, 2.5 uh, per million. So what 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 Paula Giras is saying is that the the the, the rate of in, uh, of the the severe allergic reaction is lower even than what we had thought initially. It's at about two at two people per million for the Moderna and about six people per million for the Pfizer. And if you compare that with how many people are dying every day from COVID, it, it it's not comparable. Remember. Three to four thousand people are dying every day to COVID, and you know the the, the risk of getting an allergic reaction is really really tiny, and those people are not dying. We're treating them with epinephrine, so that's important. El, el, están destacando datos nuevos. El riesgo de contraer o de tener una reacción alérgica contra la vacuna es aún menor de lo que creemos, y que si lo comparamos con la cantidad de gente que muere por día es un riesgo que deberíamos asumir ya que la reacción alérgica no si se presenta es muy raro y no mata a nadie porque se puede resolver con medicación. Ok. 
Okay. Um, so we have a question from Paula Brown. Will the vaccine be required or voluntary? Um, so we are not going to require it. It's going to be voluntary. So you can take it or not, but we're going to strongly recommend that you take it and we want everybody to take it. And again, I I'm, I'm going to tell you up front that if everybody takes it, that's the best way that we're going to get back to being normal here on campus. La vacuna no es obligatoria, es voluntaria, pero ellos recomiendan fuertemente que todo el mundo la administre. Do we have a question from the audience? Hay algún. Hay algún especial que días antes de la vacuna para venir se me tomó una pastilla, Tyler no lo. He's asking what? If, if he needs to take a Tylenol or, or something before yeah. taking the vaccine. Yeah, so um, you don't need to take a Tylenol or Motrin or Benadryl beforehand. Um, in fact, we don't recommend that you take it. If you have pain in your arm after the vaccine or after the second dose, if you get fever and chills and you have a headache, you can take Tylenol or Motrin afterwards and it's fine. It doesn't, it doesn't affect the, how well the vaccine works. So it's okay to take it, but don't take it before. Take it only if you need to afterwards. No es necesario que lo tomes antes, pero si el día que te dan la vacuna sentís un poco de dolor en el brazo o si tienes dolor de cabeza, pueden tomar Tylenol or Motrin ese día. No va a hacer nada contra la eficaz, eficacia de la vacuna, pero no necesitan tomarlo antes. So there's a question online, um, which vaccine will be administered here, Moderna or Pfizer? And the answer is we don't know. Um, we'll get one or the other. Uh, the state, North Carolina state, will be giving us the vaccine to administer here, and they haven't told us which one we're going to get. But we'll only get one, and if you get the first dose with Pfizer, you have to get the second dose with Pfizer. If you get the first dose with Moderna, you have to get the second dose. So you can't mix the vaccines with each other. You have to get one or the other. Um, and we, I don't know which, I got the Pfizer vaccine in my arm. Uh, Dr. Wojciech, who went to another UNC site, he got the Moderna vaccine. They're, the, they're equally, they're, 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 they're the, as far as I'm concerned, they're equally effective. And so it, it, it shouldn't be that you want one or the other. Either of them would be fine. No sabemos cuál de las dos vacunas, si la de Moderna o de Pfizer, vamos a recibir aquí en el instituto aún. Pero lo único que él destaca es que si se dan, las dos vacunas son de dos dosis. Si se dan la primera dosis de Moderna, tienen que darse la segunda dosis de la misma vacuna. Um, y él conoce a personas que han tomado las dos vacunas y no han notado diferencia. Él considera que las dos vacunas son esencialmente igual de eficaces. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so after the first dose, how long before the second dose? Oh, so. If you got the Pfizer vaccine, so the question is, uh, after, how long do you have to wait between the first dose and the second dose? So if you got the Pfizer vaccine, it's three weeks. And if you get the Moderna vaccine, it's four weeks. Um, and it can be plus or minus a few days. So three weeks, a day or two is fine. But it's usually three weeks and then four weeks for the Pfizer vaccine. And both, you need both shots. If you only get one shot, it doesn't work as well. If you want the 95% protection, you have to get both shots. The Pfizer 3 and Moderna. Yeah. La, la vacuna de Pfizer son tres semanas después de la primera dosis y la de Moderna son cuatro semanas después de la primera dosis. Con uno o dos días de diferencia. Puede ser cuatro semanas y un día, cuatro semanas y dos días. Pero las dos vacunas deben recibir las dos dosis. Es importante que se den las dos dosis. And it takes about, so... The protection starts about 10 days after the second dose. So you get one dose, you get the second dose, and then 10 days after that is when you're, you'll be protected from getting COVID. Y las vacunas 
son efectivas o son eficaces 10 días, de, son, ustedes están protegidos contra la enfermedad 10 días después de la segunda dosis. Um, also, I want to emphasize that even after you get the second dose and are protected, we still want you to wear masks and we still want you to wash your hands and we still want you to spread out and distance from each other. And the reason is because even though you're not going to get sick with the virus, there's a small chance that you can still get infected and pass the virus on to other people, whether it's coworkers or friends or family. The vaccine makes it so that you don't get sick from the virus, but it probably doesn't make it so that the virus can't infect you initially. Lo que él dice es que después de la segunda vacuna es importante que sigamos manteniendo las mismas costumbres que hemos tenido hasta ahora, de usar la máscara, de lavarnos las manos, de mantener la distancia con otras personas, porque a pesar de que la persona que se vacunó está protegida contra la enfermedad, es, existe un pequeño chance de que la persona vacunada no tenga la enfermedad, pero sí pueda transmitir la enfermedad a gente que no se ha vacunado. Entonces es importante que sigamos con las mismas costumbres que tenemos hasta ahora. Okay, so we're all going to be wearing masks, at least, my guess is through summer or fall, until 80% of the people in the United States get the vaccine. And then when that happens, it's called herd immunity, which you've probably heard about on TV, and the disease just goes away in the population. So. We're all going to, you're going to still have to wear masks probably until the summer or the fall at the earliest. Él estima que todo el mundo va a tener que seguir usando máscaras hasta el verano o quizás eh, otoño, porque hasta que el 80% de la gente no esté, no tenga protección contra el virus, eh, no vamos a impedir que el virus se siga transmitiendo. Entonces vamos a todos tener que seguir usando máscaras. Okay. Um, I think what else is important to uh, talk about. Um, any other questions? Oh, uh, testing, the other thing. How many of you are, are getting tested where they put the swab up your nose? Are any of you getting tested for COVID on a regular basis? Or how many have you gotten tested? Nobody? Nobody has gone through the test. Si, ¿Cuántos de ustedes o si algunos de ustedes se han hecho el test de COVID que hacen aquí en el, en el parking? No. no. Sí. Ah, te lo hicieron, pero no aquí. She got tested, but not here. Okay. So, uh, we still want you to get tested after you get the vaccine. Because, again, it's possible that you get infected and then you can spread the disease onto other people, even though you're not going to get sick. In fact, it may be more likely that you're going to have asymptomatic or no symptoms with the disease. And so we would like all of you to get tested in the car line. And that will tell us that you don't have COVID even after you have the vaccine. You should be tested now on a regular basis. So encourage them to get tested. Es importante que todos nos hagamos el test regularmente porque para nosotros saber eh, si estamos eh, infectados o no. Pero lo que él quiere decir es que después de vacunarnos igual tenemos que seguir haciendo eso porque ya las personas que se vacunan quizás no se enferman, pero sí podemos transmitirlo a otras personas sin saber porque no vamos a tener síntomas. Entonces es importante que continuemos haciendo el, el, da, haciendo el examen regularmente. Okay. How, many, how many times have you been tested? Every week since you started, so, so bad, a sense. lot. <laughs> yeah, so I, I get tested every week, and Dr. Pascual gets tested every week, maybe more than once a week, right? Sometimes I know because I've done the test <laughs> a couple of times. All right, we have a question online that says, can you get COVID again even if you've already had it? So if you, have any of you had COVID? No. So if you get COVID, you have Uh, you're, you're, you have a, a short period where you're immune, where you're not going to get it. But after about two or three months, that immunity goes away, and there's a good chance that you could get infected again with COVID. With the vaccine, we don't know how long the immunity will last. We think it will last somewhere about a year, maybe longer. We don't know. 
it may be that we have to get a shot again in a year or two years or three years as a booster. Just like the flu shots that you get every year, you get every year you get a shot. It may be we have to do something like this for COVID. We don't know yet because we haven't had enough time to study the disease. The disease has only been here for a year. And the people in the clinical trial that got the vaccine, they've only been followed for four or six months. And so we only know that it lasts at least that long. La pregunta es si la gente que tuvo COVID puede volver a tener COVID y la respuesta es sí. Eh, la inmunidad natural creemos que dura de dos a tres meses, o sea que si tuviste COVID en enero puedes tener COVID de vuelta en abril. Con la vacuna eh, piensan que esa inmunidad puede durar de seis meses a un año, no están seguros, pero creen que probablemente dure hasta un año, o sea que quizás sea como la vacuna del, de la gripe que nos damos una vacuna una vez al año. So the question, will we get a card or something that says that we got the vaccine? And the answer is yes. So you're going to get a little card. I should have brought my card. And it'll say which vaccine you got and when you got it. And it'll have your name on it. And it'll say when, where you got the vaccine. And you want to keep that card. That's going to be important because it'll show that you're vaccinated. You want to take a picture with your phone so that if anybody asks, have you been vaccinated, you can show them. Eh, cuando les den la vacuna les van a dar un carnet de vacunación que va a decir dónde se dieron la vacuna, qué tipo de vacuna se dieron y es importante que guarden eso para poder demostrar que los vacunaron. O sea, que guarden esa tarjeta, saquen una foto con el teléfono para tenerlo seguro. Okay. One other point I want to make. So, this may not be relevant to you, but it may be relevant to friends or family. So, when you go to get the vaccine, they don't ask for ID. You don't have to show a driver's license. You don't have to show a birth certificate. You don't, you don't have to show anything. You go there, you give them your name, they write it down, they put it in the computer, they give you a vaccine, they watch you, and you leave. And so if any of you have friends or family that are undocumented, that are not in the country illegally, it's fine. We want to vaccinate those people too, and there's no risk whatsoever that they're going to send immigration or something during the second dose. I have a good friend who's not documented and she didn't want to get the vaccine because she was afraid that when she showed up for the second shot, immigration was going to be there to send her back to Mexico. And that's not the case. They don't ask for anything. They just ask for your name, no ID, you get your vaccine and you're, you're done. Otra cosa que él quiere resaltar que quizás no es relevante para ustedes, pero sí para gente que conozcan, amigos o familiares, es que cuando van a recibir la vacuna, no necesitan dar documentación. Lo único que tienen que dar es su nombre. O sea que si conocen gente que está indocumentada, que no está aquí legalmente, no eh, tengan miedo de que va a haber riesgo de nada al presentarse porque no les van a pedir documentación. Quieren que todo el mundo se vacune, no importa. Okay. Uh, there's a question, uh, are there any updates on when the pharmacies will get the vaccine? So, CVS and Wal uh, Walgreens have the vaccine, but they're administering the vaccine to nursing home patients, to old people who are in, in nursing homes. That's what they're doing right now. But UNC system hospitals and doctor's offices, Duke hospital system and other, other locations have the vaccine and are giving those vaccines to their patients who meet certain criteria. So if you're over 75, uh, you can go to your doctor or you can go to the Durham County or the Orange County Public Health Clinic and you can get your vaccine there too. You don't have to have it here. You can get it anywhere you want. And I think maybe even now, 65 years and older can get the vaccine. And soon they'll make it available for people who have certain conditions that make them at risk for, for COVID, like diabetes, obesity, um, heart disease, lung disease, and other kinds of conditions. And again, they'll make these available through the doctors, through the health clinics, um, and eventually through the pharmacies as well. La pregunta es si las farmacias CVS o Walgreens tienen estas vacunas, y la respuesta es que sí, pero que de momento las están distribuyendo solo a gente en residencias de ancianos pero que los hospitales de UNC, de Duke y otras clínicas del área sí las están dando a pacientes mayores de 65 años. O sea, que si conocen a alguien mayor de 65 años, 
o que cumple ciertos requerimientos como diabetes, obesidad, otro tipo de enfermedades que los ponen en riesgo, pueden ir a esos lugares a recibir la vacuna. Okay. So we have a question. Will the immunization be necessary every year to enhance immunity? And the answer, I think I answered that. We don't know. Um, it may be that we have to get a booster once a year, or every other year, or every few years. We just don't know yet. We, we hope that you get the vaccine and you're protected for a long time so you don't have to get another one. Um, there are certain vaccines, like measles vaccine, that you only get once and you're protected for the rest of your life. Uh, we don't know yet whether uh, whether the, the COVID vaccine will work like that. Um, está hablando de cuánto dura el efecto de la vacuna y la verdad es que aún no sabemos que hay algunas vacunas que nos damos una vez en la vida y nunca más. No sabemos si esto va a ser el caso para la vacuna de, contra el COVID. Okay. Other questions. How many of you are planning on getting the vaccine? Most? For those of you who, who are still thinking about it, can you tell me what the reasons are that you would not get it? So, I, so we understand um, you know, what concerns we have to address in presentations that we make to other people. Para la gente que no está planeando en vacunarse, él quiere saber si nos contarían cuáles son las razones por las cuales no se quieren vacunar para saber cómo podemos eh, comunicarnos con, con ustedes. This is audience participation part of, part of it. Entonces, ¿Tienen algún miedo de la vacuna? ¿Tienen, ¿Han escuchado algo que la vacuna provoca algo que no quieren estar expuestos o...? ¿Cuáles serían las razones por las cuales no se, no se vacunarían? Si nos quieren contar. No es obligatorio. No. Se vas a vacunar. Okay. okay. Uh, we have one more question online. I've, uh, I've heard from other family and friends that they don't have to think, that they don't think the vaccine has had enough time to be tested and are still hesitant about possible long-term side effects. Um, so, so even though the vaccine has been created quickly and been tested very quickly, it's important to know that the, the testers didn't cut corners in the process. The NIH has been working on coronavirus vaccines for many, many years before the pandemic, um, because coronaviruses have been around for many years. Um, there was the SARS, uh, there was MERS, there was other diseases that have been caused by coronavirus many years ago. And so the government has been working on these vaccines for many years. And so the reason we were able to do it so quickly is because we already had a lot of the technologies and a lot of the preliminary work done. Um, Most of, the, most of the side effects from a vaccine occur within a short period of time. If you don't see effects usually within 45 or 60 days, then it's going to be fine. That's what Dr. Fauci says. And so that's why the studies that have been done had to follow people for at least 60 or 90 days, actually, before they were able to to recommend that everybody get the vaccine. Those are two, good, two important concepts. Hay, hay gente que está un poco preocupada de que la vacuna se desarrolló muy rápido y que se hicieron los exámenes clínicos muy rápido y que por eso les da un poco de miedo. Pero lo que él dice es que la razón por la cual desarrollamos tan rápido la vacuna es porque hace muchos años que estamos estudiando el tipo de virus llamado coronavirus que causó otras enfermedades como SARS, como uh, MERS, y por eso teníamos un montón de información que usamos para crear la vacuna más rápido, pero que no por eso se saltaron ningún paso de probar si la vacuna era segura o no. O sea que sabemos que la vacuna es segura. Y lo, el otro punto que él quiere eh, reforzar es que la mayoría de la vacuna, todas las vacunas que, que tenemos, eh, que se han usado, los síntomas se presentan siempre en un periodo muy corto de tiempo, entre tres y seis semanas. O sea que sabemos que el 100% de las vacunas tendría que tuvieran que, te, que tendrían efectos secundarios 
ya los hubiéramos visto en este en este tiempo. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I guess if there's no more questions online, no more questions here. Let me just end by thanking you for coming. If you have any questions, um, I can be reached. Most of you know where my office is, I think, on the second floor. You can come knock on the door and, and I'll answer your questions. Um, uh, or you can you can email me or you can maybe you can give them uh, my email address so they can email me. Um, but I really want to emphasize that it's important to get the vaccine. So I've personally had several friends who have had family members die of COVID recently, um, young, healthy people. Um, and so it's not fun when you have a family member with the disease and it's not fun having a family member or a good friend die of COVID. And we have the technology now to be able to protect you and your family. And so we really want to have you take advantage of that. And it'll also make NIEHS a safer place for everybody. Agradecerles por venir y también urgirlos a que consideren la vacuna, ya que él personalmente conoce a mucha gente y estoy seguro que ustedes también eh, que tuvo COVID y que quizás hasta murió por COVID. Entonces es importante que nos protejamos a todos entre nosotros y nos vacunemos todos. So why don't you give them my email address, Zeldinet, and maybe even your email address if they want to uh, ask in Spanish. So, si tienen alguna pregunta o quieren ponerse en contacto con nosotros, yo les puedo dar mi dirección de email o la de él también. Si tienen alguna pregunta en el futuro. Okay, so the question was, which vaccine are we going to get? So we don't know. Um, we don't know yet because we get we're going to get the vaccine from the North Carolina State Health Department, and they haven't told us, and they haven't told us when we're getting the vaccine. We, we're set up to do it now. We've gotten all the infrastructure in place to do it. We've got all the people ready to go, trained and so forth. But we just have to wait for the state to get us the vaccine now. Um, we will get either the Moderna or the Pfizer, and whichever one we get, that's the one we're going to continue to get as we vaccinate the population. And we hope to get enough vaccine to vaccinate everybody here at the Institute in phases. You know, the first phase will be you all and the cleaning crews and the building crews and the co and you know anybody who's who is high risk. And then we'll start with people who are over 65 who are we're in group zero, which were the people who really never left campus. The animal workers are going to be in the in the first group. You know, the people who take care of the mice, who clean the cages, and so forth. Um, you know, then we're going to go to people in Group A, Group B, Group C, Group D, and in each group, we'll give we'll we'll offer it first to people over 65, and then to people who are younger. Um, so it'll be a very clear rollout. Everybody's going to be notified by email when their appointment is. Um, And they'll, they'll come, they'll get it, they'll get their vaccine, and then we'll make sure that it's all coordinated. We'll keep track of that. They'll give you a little card when you get the vaccine, and you should keep that card. You probably should take a picture of the card with your, your iPhone, because at some point in the future, um, there may be times where you'll have to prove that you've been vaccinated to do things. Like, for example, there and I've heard that some airlines are going to require proof of vaccination to allow people to travel. Um, you know, boats may require for cruises and so forth. Um, and there are some events where they're going to limit the number of people who don't have vaccinations uh, to attend. So, um, you know, keep that card with you. It'll be proof that you've been vaccinated. Um, yeah, so we don't know which one, but we'll get one or the other, and we hope it'll be within the next week or two. Okay. Who's second in charge? I have a question for the first. I wonder if you, maybe, why don't you use one of the microphones? so that people can hear you online. Oh, yep, yeah, that's perfect. Just pass it around, it'll be fine. We got a parent who's 66. Uh, we're trying to convince her to get this vaccination, but she's, she has asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, and she's a little, Speak up. she's a little concerned about taking this shit. So my question to you is, should I, I know it's a vaccine and she should get it, but what can I tell her to, ease her mind to go ahead and take this vaccine. Yeah, so so family members. So yeah, so the, so in fact, people with that, so you say you're, you're, she has asthma. So people with asthma are actually at increased risk for getting bad disease and increased risk of dying if they get the disease. And so she's exactly, and I assume that she's older. Yeah, 66. So she's in a, in a high risk group. So she should absolutely get the disease. You know, the question is, how do you convince people to get, get it? You know, there's a lot of mistrust of, of, 
science and the medical establishment, and I think some of that has, may, have, may have been related to the previous administration and how it handled things with you know, lack of transparency and so forth. Um, and, and in general, I think communities of color, there's a lot of mistrust of, of, of physicians and, and the medical establishment. So I think you just have to reassure them. I mean, we'll post this talk on, our, on the website. You know, you should feel free to, to, to show your family members this talk. Let them listen to this video. Um, and, and, you know, they can listen to the question and answer session um, and um, make a decision up for themselves. But I think ultimately, you know, it's, it's, it's the right thing to do because not only are they going to protect themselves, but they're going to protect their friends and other family members, you know, aunts, uncles, you know, and, and so, it, you know, and until we get everybody or at least the overwhelming majority of people in the country to get the vaccine, we're going to still be dealing with coronavirus. I mean, the only way to get rid of this is going to be to have 80-ish, 85 percent of the population vaccinated, and that will achieve something called herd immunity, which basically means that almost everybody is immune, and then the disease will just go away. And, um, and we you know we may need booster shots at some point in the future to, to keep the immune system from, you know, from, from uh, keep, or keep the immune system strong against the virus. But for the most part, you know, once we achieve 80 percent of uh, immunity, then, then the disease will go away and we can all get back to normal lives. Um, you know, we'll be able to start going out again. We'll be able to start doing things again. Um, the economy will recover. Schools will open, et cetera. Um, one point I want to make is that um, just because you're going to be vaccinated doesn't mean that you have, you, 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 you can take your guard down in terms of, of the protective things that you're doing now. So you're going to still be required to wear masks. You're still going to be required to wash your hands. Um, you're still going to be required to distance from people whenever possible. Um, and the reason is because the vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting infected. It prevents you from getting the disease if you get infected. So, you know, you get you you might get exposed to COVID by a friend, and you may get the infection. But then the immune system is going to kick in and prevent you from getting sick. But during that short time between when you get infected and when the immune system kicks in and prevents you from getting sick, you may actually be contagious and spread the disease to other people. So even though you've had the vaccine, you still need to wear a mask and you still need to be careful until uh, we get to a point where everybody in the country is immune and it doesn't make a difference who gets sick because there's no more disease. So, so you shouldn't think that I get vaccinated, then I don't have to wear a mask anymore. I can go out with my friends and drink and go to big parties, you know, no, you're, you're still going to have to follow the same precautions, at least for the next few months. But then hopefully towards the summer, spring, summer, as people get vaccinated, we'll be able to start lifting some of these restrictions and get back to normal. Yeah. Uh, speak in. in so we can. When, the, when the Institute gets the vaccine here, and it's going to be for the officers and you said the janitorial staff and okay, when you get that vaccine and we take the vaccine, will there be enough vaccine to give us our set? Dose. You, you'll have enough here to do the second dose. Yeah, yeah, that's the plan. Um, so there, so initially, they, the state rolled out a bunch of vaccine and told all the public health departments, "We'll get you more. Go ahead and give all the vaccine that you have on, you know, and and we'll make sure you get more in time for the second doses." Um, and so they they did that. They rolled it out, and then they then the state came back and said, "Well." we hope we'll have enough for the second doses. And so what a lot of places now are doing is they're, they're holding in the freezer the second doses for people who got the first doses to make sure that we can, for example, UNC is doing that. So UNC actually this week, um, they gave a bunch of vaccines, they gave like 20,000 vaccines in the last couple of weeks. Um, and they are having to cancel appointments for this week and next week because they wanna make sure they have enough of the doses in the freezer to give the people who got the first vaccine, the first dose. So the two doses are either three or four weeks apart. For the Pfizer vaccine, uh, the two doses are three weeks apart. And for the Moderna vaccine, they're four weeks apart. Um, but, but that's kind of plus or minus a little bit. So if you get it a little late, it's okay. If you get it a little early, it's okay. But what we don't want is just to get one dose because it's not gonna be effective if you just get one dose. And what you don't want is to wait too far into the distant future. My guess is with the supply chain, um, there will not be a problem with, with second doses, but we may have to 
I mean, we're not we're not going to get as many doses as we need to vaccinate everybody right away. They'll give us probably a couple hundred, and then we'll vaccinate, and then they'll give us another couple hundred. And so that's why we're going to be doing this in phases. And the hope would be that over the next couple of months, we'll get enough to vaccinate everybody here. Okay. Other questions. All right, sir. I'm uh, I'm curious about the allergy aspect of because I have a ten year old who has an egg allergy, mm -hmm. and I know that most flu shots have uh, protein of egg in it. Yeah. Now, um, are you not recommending that people who have these uh, allergies take the shot? Yeah. So this vaccine, unlike the flu vaccine, has no egg in it, so it's perfectly safe for for people with egg allergy to take this vaccine. Perfectly safe. It, all, all the vaccine, as I showed you, all it has is those lipids, the, the, the uh, fats on the outside, and then the RNA on the inside. That's all it is. And most of the allergic reactions are to the fats on the outside. And very, very few people have allergy to, to those kinds of fats. So, yeah, if you have history of egg allergy or milk allergy or hay fever or or allergic asthma or allergic eye disease, you know, some it'll be fine for you to take the vaccine. Now, if you if you tell somebody you have a history of allergy, we'll probably watch you a little closer. We'll watch you for 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes after the dose. So you so if you when your son gets the dose, he'll he'll be watched he or she he or she will be watched for a little longer. Note that we're not going to give kids the vaccine yet. So the the vaccine hasn't been studied in anybody under 16 yet. They're just now starting the trials uh the clinical trials studying in children. And we want to be sure that it's going to be safe and effective in kids, just like it is in older people and adults. So until that happens, the FDA is not going to approve giving the, the vaccine to kids. And so kids are probably not going to get it in that first round. Um, teachers will get it, um, but the kids will probably end up waiting until later on in the year when we have the data for them. So, he, yeah, so uh, unfortunately, they for whatever reason, they decided not to include kids in the trial. And that's probably reasonable because you want to make sure it's safe in adults before you start giving it to kids who can't really consent uh, to being in the trial. So, yeah. Other questions? I have a few questions online while you guys are thinking about it, maybe. All right, we got one more here, and then we'll go online. My concern is... So, yeah, so let me, let me, let me be clear with you. You're not going to get sick for 14 days from the vaccine. The most that'll happen with the vaccine is you'll get a sore arm with the first shot and you may get some of those mild side effects that I, that I showed earlier, the, you know, kind of fever, achy feeling, headache that will last 24 to 36 hours maximum with the second dose. So you're not going to get 14 days of, of illness with the vaccine. Now, you can get 14 days or more of illness if you get COVID. Um, and, or if, you're, if you have COVID, even if you don't have symptoms and you have to quarantine at home, you may have to quarantine for 14 days. You don't infect other, other people, other security guards and so forth. My understanding in talking with the, um, the, the heads of the contracts for the security group is that um, if you have to take off time because you're COVID positive, uh, so you're, let's say you get, you go to the asymptomatic testing line and you're, you're, you feel fine, but they test you and they find you have COVID. And so you have to quarantine for, for 14 days. My understanding is that there'll be a way for you to get paid during that time. In fact, I think there's, there's now a national requirement for that through, through the health, through a, through a special act that was passed. And again, you should contact your, your, your contract officer, the, 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 the contract people to, 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 to get the details of that. Um, you came up yesterday at, at, one, at one of the sessions we had, and um, um, I guess the, the project manager, the, the NIH project manager, was there, and, and he was uh, he, he took note of this. And so, that should not be a deterrent. It shouldn't be a deterrent to take the vaccine, but it also shouldn't be a deterrent to get 
to get the the testing in the testing line. You know, if you get COVID, you know, there'll be you, you'll be able to get. My understanding is you'll be able to get get covered for the time that you're that you're out of here. So you won't you won't be at risk. So that's not the reason not to get tested. I should say a few things about testing. So how many of you are any of you getting tested in the testing line? No. Can I get that in writing? I mean. So, I, so again, I, I'm not a contract expert. So, I, so I'm, yeah. So let me be clear that I'm not a contract expert, and I don't make those decisions. But, but I, my, my recommendation would be that you talk, as a union representative, you talk with your, with your management, and you get the details of that in writing from them. And my understanding is that the, the your, your your the contractor, the the, the people who pay you. Um, there are there are processes in place to ensure that you continue to get paid if you were to take time off because you were asked to quarantine for COVID. Because what we don't want is one of you to have COVID and then be coming into work because you feel fine and then spreading it around the building. That would be like really stupid, right? So so we don't we absolutely don't want that. And again, this came up yesterday with some of the cleaning staff. They were reassured that this is not going to be an issue and it shouldn't be an issue for you either. Before we ask, ask the other question, let, let me tell you a little. So, some of you are getting tested, right? So, and, and you should be tested at least every week. I get tested every week. It's easy. You go to the parking lot, you pull up your car on your way to work. You know, they they, they stick a small Q-tip up in front part of your nose. Doesn't hurt. They put it in a tube and you drive off. It takes about 30 seconds, um, and you get your result in two days. They tell you whether or not uh, you're you're positive, and it's it's quick, it's easy, and it ensures that you're not going to be a spreader in, and, and because because of your jobs I mean you're walking the building you're 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 all over the place you're you're responding to emergencies you're you're you're, you're sitting at the front gate you know and you're you're going within a few feet of somebody when you take their temperature right so you're you guys are hard, hot guys and, and women are at, are at high risk and so the last thing we want is for one of you to be infected and be spreading it I mean if there's somebody at the front gate who sees everybody who comes in, and we see about 900 people come in every day, and they're positive. You know, we we run the risk of having you know most of our population become positive, and that would be a disaster. Not only would we have to shut down the building, we would have to stop COVID research. I mean, we're doing research trying to find cures for COVID. We're trying to understand, you know, how the virus works. We're trying to you know understand how the the vaccine works, what part of the the virus the vaccine binds to. We're doing a lot of that really hardcore basic research here. So we can't afford to shut down. So that, that's why all of you should be tested, if at all possible. So, yeah, I, and, and again, I, I think I think this is this is maybe a good time for you all to meet with whoever your boss is and then have as a group meeting with the with the contract uh, your your contractor, the the supervisor of your contract and have them meet with the the federal person who's in charge of the contract, the project manager, and and make sure everybody's on the same page with this. Because I, you know, I mean, I think some of you know I, I kind of got wind of this several weeks ago, and I, I looked into it, and I sent off some emails, and I was ensured that that this was going to be taken care of. But it sounds like the word has not gotten out, or there's inconsistent information that's being put out there, or it's not gotten out well enough to relieve concerns that you may have. So we need we need to fix that. I agree. Right. Question here and then one more. Okay. Um, I can contest to the word not getting out because I myself was um, adversely affected by COVID through a family member. And I was asked to quarantine for 14 days. Now, I reached out to the heads of my department and I was forced to use my PTO time to cover it. And I was told that I was not covered. So I'm thinking that's the reason why a lot of officers are apprehensive of taking the test and getting diagnosed as positive and not be covered. And they will they don't have the the PTO time to cover the time, they will go for no, day without being paid. So I think the as a union rep, I think the what we really need is something formally in writing because from my understanding, when it's in writing, that's something that they have to and, live and up to. I agree, and and, and 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 you know the devil is in the details. You've heard that comment before. So so it may be. So it, were you COVID, were you COVID positive? No, I had. Yeah. That's so, the thing. I get it happened early to me, mm -hmm. and I didn't. They didn't have any uh, 
thing for me to go where to go get tested. Right. So, so it may be that the rules say that you have to be COVID positive in order to get take advantage of this reimbursement. So, for example, let's say you went to a party last night and you were exposed to somebody who later found out they got COVID. And you might say, well, I, I, I want to quarantine for two weeks. It may be that that's not covered under this under this program. It may be that you actually have to have COVID. In other words, you have to have a positive test and show proof of a positive test, and then you get covered. So I, I don't know the details of how this works, but but, but I, I would you all should know what those details are. Um, absolutely, you should know that somebody should be able to sit down with you and say, here are the conditions in which in which in which case you're covered, and here are the things where where we're not going to cover you. So if you you know if you if you're in the mall and you 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 cross paths with somebody who you think is COVID and you want to quarantine for two weeks, you know, you're probably really low risk and you know, maybe you don't need to quarantine and so we're not going to cover you for that. We have an occupational medical service here of people, people who are public health experts who will tell you based on talking with you whether, you're not, whether or not you should quarantine and for how long. And so again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a contract expert, but I can tell you that there may be situations where you wouldn't be covered. But if you have COVID, you have a, a test that's positive, and you're, said, you're told you must quarantine for X number of days, there should be a mechanism to cover you for that. Yes, sir. And at the time, I um, was told by my upper management that I had to uh, quarantine mm -hmm. because I was next to my daughter who was tested positive. Right. And that was no problem for me. Uh, the problem came for me is when uh, I had to reach out to the occupational health nurse mm -hmm. to find assistance and where to go to get uh, the testing. And fortunately for me, I was never tested positive. That happened here. So you I had you to did get here. tested, you just didn't come out positive? I didn't come out positive. Yeah. So, uh, but that didn't stop the fact that I was quarantined for 14 days and I was still so you, Yeah, so you, should, you, should look in, you should look into the details and it may be that you have, it may be that one of the requirements of getting the, the, the paid leave is that you have to test positive for COVID. I don't know the details of that, but your contract, your, your project manager and your, your supervisor in the contract should be able to get those details and give those to you and have it be clear so that everybody knows what the rules are. Yeah, every, that, that's the, again, I can't, I can't change the rules, but I can, I can ensure that we will give you what, the, we will tell you what the rules are so that there's no confusion and so that everybody knows. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, we had one more question, I think, over here. Um, if you take prescription medicine or over-the-counter vitamins, would it have any adverse effects when you no. take it? No, um, the, there's no, no contraindications to taking the vaccine for prescription medicine. They'll ask you, and this was actually a question in the chat function, they'll ask you if you're taking a blood thinner when you, uh, like, like uh, Coumadin or uh, uh, heparin injections or something, uh, which makes your blood uh, not clot as well. They'll ask you that before you take the injection. And the main reason, that's not going to be a, a reason not to give you the injection. It just means they're going to they're going to hold pressure on your arm a little longer and they're going to make sure you don't get a bruise where they give you the injection. You know, they'll hold pressure to make sure that you have time to clot. Um, you know, same thing for, for if you take aspirin on a regular basis for heart problems or something. But yeah, there's no, there are no specific drugs that you, you would take where, where the, the nurses would say, I'm not going to give you a vaccine. Now, if you're, if you're sick, one of the things they'll do, they'll take your temperature when you show up to the vaccine clinic and they'll ask you, are you having symptoms? And if you say, yeah, I have fever and chills and I don't feel well, they're probably going to say, go home. <laughs> you shouldn't be here because <laughs> you're sick. Come back again next week. So they're probably not going to give you a vaccine if you're actually not feeling well. And that's not because the vaccine is not going to work. It's mostly because we don't want you here if you're not feeling well because you could have COVID, right? So, so you know, common sense stuff. Uh, but you shouldn't get on campus if you have a fever. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be allowed on the building if you answer the questions at the front gate. Do you feel good, right? So um, yeah, so it's fine fine for any types of medicines: high blood pressure medicines, diabetes medicines, heart medicines, kidney med. It's all fine. Yeah. All right. Let me uh, go through some of these questions that are online. Let's see. Um, how soon after exposure are you contagious to somebody else? Yeah. So the incubation period for the virus is somewhere between two and five days. So what that means is that if you're exposed to somebody who you know is positive to COVID, 
you know, over the next two to five days, if you're going to be positive, you're going to get positive then. And so typically what we recommend is that you wait, is that you quarantine for a period of time, and then you get a test. And if your test is negative, you don't need to quarantine anymore. Um, if you don't want to get a test, you're probably safe to quarantine for a longer period. So if you don't want to get a test, we, we usually say 10 days. But, but two to five days is the average time that the virus takes to, to, to get into the nose and throat, to multiply, and then to, to start an infection. Um, uh, should you quarantine at home between vaccines? No. Uh, you don't need to quarantine at home between vaccines. Again, you're not getting... Um, you're, you're not getting the live virus with the vaccine. There's no risk of the vaccine giving you COVID, so there's no reason to quarantine between the two doses. Uh, can you talk more about antibody tests and if they're encouraged and how definitive they are in detecting if somebody previously had COVID? So there are two kinds of tests that you can get. There's the RNA tests that we do here in the, in the, in the parking lot, and there are the antibody tests. They tell very different things. So the RNA tests actually detect the RNA from the virus. So they, the, the stuff on the inside of the virus that makes all the different proteins in the virus, that RNA, the, the tests that we do here in the parking lot um, and the tests that Walgreens does and CVS Pharmacy does, they all, test the, they all detect the RNA. And the tests are highly sensitive, so we can detect tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of that RNA. So even if you're really early in infection, or if you only have a mild infection with not a lot of the virus, we'll still be able to detect it with the RNA. Um, the antibody tests uh, test, well, there's, so there's three kinds of tests. So there's a, there's, a, there's a test that detects the viral protein, so that detects the, that little red spiky protein. Instead of detecting the RNA that makes the protein, it detects the protein. Um, those tests are not as sensitive as the tests that test the RNA, but they tend to be more rapid. So some of the some of the tests that you've seen, uh, you've probably seen them online, where you can go and you, it's like a pregnancy test, and you you, know, you 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 put your saliva on a little thing, and then and then in an hour you read it, and it's either positive or negative. It's like a pregnancy test. So that detects the viral protein. And again, they're okay. They're 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 not as sensitive, so they don't. You have to have a much bigger infection to be able to detect it. But it's probably better than not getting tested. But you can get these also. You can buy them at Walgreens and CVS. You can, you can. They're becoming more and more available now. And then there's the antibody test. So that's the test that detects whether or not you have antibodies in your bloodstream against the virus. And so all that tells you is that you've been exposed to the virus at some point in the past. It doesn't tell you that you're infected now. Um, and so. You know, if you're antibody positive, that just tells you that at some point in the last few months you've had the virus. Um, I don't particularly find those tests to be particularly useful, except on a population basis when you're interested in finding out how many in a community have been infected. And we actually have a study in the CRU, which you all can join. It's called the Ciro study, where we're drawing blood periodically and measuring these antibodies to virus to see who in the population is getting COVID without knowing it and who isn't. Um, and they're also doing the PCR tests periodically, the, the, the RNA test as well. And they're asking a bunch of questions. So if you're interested in that and you want to sign up for the study, it's an easy study. They, I think they pay you a small amount and you get a blood drawn every, every few months and, and then they'll measure and they'll tell you whether or not you've had, you've had antibodies. Um, let's see. Does the vaccine interfere with specific medicines, over-the-counter medicines, vitamins, et cetera? No. Um, trying to understand if there's a need to prepare for the injection. So there's no need to prepare for the injection. There's nothing that, that you need to do in advance. Um, you would take your usual medicines if you're on a blood pressure medicine or a diabetes medicine or you're on insulin or you're on heart medicine. You would, you would do what you would normally do the day you get your vaccine. Other questions here? Yeah. My question is about the safety of the officers working at the post. Um, what what um, actually, I'm wondering about the gown. What good does the gown do? Because yeah. my thing is, if you're wearing them at the post up there and you're not wearing them anywhere else, but see, are you in the post? I mean, but those same people are coming in this building, walking around us. So is the gown any good? Is there a need for the gown or is it just? So 
So let, let me, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you my opinion on, uh, we call this PPE, personal protective equipment. And so how does the virus spread? So we, you know, so we know now after studying this virus for a year that the most, the most likely way that this virus spreads is through the respiratory system, through, through respiratory droplets. So through, you know, so you cough, you speak, you sneeze, you, you and, and it, you're, the virus is on the little water droplets that are in the air, and then they pass on to other people who breathe in those droplets, and then the virus infects the nose and the back of the throat and can get into the lungs. So that that's by far and away the most likely way that this virus spreads. Early on in the, in, before we knew a lot about this virus, there was a lot of concern that they were able to detect the virus on smooth surfaces. So somebody with the virus would be up here giving a talk, and then they would they would test the, the, the podium, and they would be able to detect at low levels a little bit of virus on the podium. And so that concerned everybody, and that's why that's why we wipe off the microphones, and that's why we you know you wipe off the you know, and we're very careful about wiping off the front, the front you know the, where everybody signs in and wiping off the pens and all that stuff. To be quite honest with you, the virus doesn't really spread that way. That's that's probably overkill. There's no good data in the year or year or so that we that we um, have known this virus to suggest that that's how the virus spreads. I, I'm not aware of anybody who's gotten the virus by touching a pen, you know, or by touching um, you know by touching a countertop. That said, you know, we know that the virus can survive on smooth surfaces, and so that's why we recommend hand hygiene. Right? Gloves are worthless. I wouldn't even wear gloves. They're they're completely <laughs> <laughs> Com completely worthless. They do not. You're much better off not wearing gloves and just washing your hands frequently or using hand sanitizer. Gloves do nothing to to protect you. Um, yeah. So the gown again. I know it's it's part of your protocol. It, it's probably protecting any virus particles if you were to be exposed from getting on your your clothes and maybe bringing it home. Again, the risk of you infecting your family members by being exposed on your clothes is really really low. The biggest Thing that you can do to prevent, and, and I've been, I've emphasized. I mean, you all know I've emphasized this because you know when I see you up front with the mask like this, you know I say put it up. Uh, you know the biggest thing you can do to prevent transmission is wear a mask um, and, and wear it properly above your nose and above your mouth. Um, there's some data now that you know two masks are better than one. You know two. You know I, I don't know that I uh, buy into that yet. Um, it's certainly not any worse. I mean, it's not going to hurt having two masks. The surgical masks, like what I'm wearing, like what most of you are wearing, are perfectly okay. They're better than, um, than I guess none of you are wearing the bandanas. You know, those work okay, but not as well as surgical masks. The kind of masks that, that you're wearing, you know, the, the cloth masks, as long as you wash them pretty regularly and they're not too old, um, they, they should work well as well, particularly the ones that are two-layer or three-layer. Um, but by far and away, the most the most important thing to do is you have to wear a mask. You know, I'm personally, I, I mean, I don't wear gowns. I mean, I walk around the building every day. You all see me do that. I, I'm not wearing gowns. I'm not wearing gloves. You know, I'm wearing a mask, you know, and I wash my hands when I'm done walking around before I touch anything else because if, if I'm touching the doors or I'm touching, you know, I want to make sure that, that I'm not spreading it to myself or to other people. Okay. Um, does the vaccine interfere with any specifics? We already covered that. Any other questions? If not, so you all going to get the vaccine? So you're not going to be forced to, but we really strongly encourage it. And if you have any questions after this, you know, let me know. Um, we, I will reach out. So who, who's the project? Who's the project officer again? Uh, yeah. So he was here yesterday for the second session, um, and so he he knows about this concern. I'll 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 reach out to Don again today and make sure that that. Um, that so he's the Fed, right? He's the Fed. Yeah. So he he will he will have to work with whoever the the boss is on the contract side, and make sure that the communication is clear and uh, and in writing. Yeah. We want to, we want to make sure that that happens because what we don't want is for any of you not to get the vaccine because you're afraid that you're get you know or 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 not to get tested. We want you to get tested. We want you to get the vaccine. We want you to be safe because you know all you get sick. You know we're screwed. We have to close the place because we can't afford to, to run this place without security, right? Especially now, uh, especially in these times, you know, these political times where you know we're 
federal security officers are, are you know, that much critical in protecting federal space. So thank you for all you do. And if you have any questions, you all know where I live, second floor A, just you know, feel free to stop by the office and, or send me an email or, um, or stop me as I come in and, and out every day. I'm happy to answer any questions. And let me know what's going on with the, with the contract concerns and I'll, I'll, I'll follow with Don. And if that's not fixed within a few days, let me know and I'll keep on pushing it. Okay, thank you so much.